Hello and welcome to Lightmap from Sifter. On Lightmap, we explore what it takes to make video games and interactive media. And we talk about the pieces that bring that all together. It's been an incredible year for video games. And if you've listened to Sifter before, you know we love talking about the sound and the music that I think really elevates an experience from being great to being iconic, incredible. And I think... Uh, my guest would probably agree with me on this episode, Mina Shamali, who you might know from ABC Classics, The Game Show, which is a weekly uh, video game music show elevating the best soundtracks and video games. Also a multi-instrumentalist uh, in their own right. Mina, thank you so much for joining us on Lightmap. It is my absolute pleasure. Now, we've asked you to go and select some of the best pieces of music from soundtracks uh, throughout 2020. Uh, I asked you to not narrow it down to your top five, and how many have you picked for us? <laughs> It, with great difficulty, I've presented 12. <laughs> but even that is... Just, with an asterisk. <laughs> uh, there, yeah, it's 12, but it's actually 24, but it's actually 500. I listen to about 12 a week. Literally, that's just part of the job. And that's at least 12 a week. <laughs> so, well. We're really looking forward to exploring some of the best uh, sounds from video games in 2022. But before we do that, let's find out what's been making the news this week with the top stories on the latest episode of Walkthrough, which is Sifter's news podcast. Okay, Mina, now tell me, when you're selecting music for your show, the things that you're enjoying, do you sit down with a controller and do you listen to it in the context or is it all about getting on the uh, the music service as soon as these soundtracks become available? <laughs> so if it were a matter of playing every single game and listening to the soundtrack in its intended gameplay context, I don't think I'd have the time to do the show. <laughs> Uh, it can be that sometimes if uh, we're playing some video games uh, and really vibing with what the soundtracks are going. Like, you know, I have my favorites and my go-tos, but it really is about uh, going to the music itself understand and understanding the context of the music, understanding the story of the music. I definitely have not played, like, I think we easily would have played like upwards. Well, we played about what, eight, like anything where between five to 10 uh, soundtracks an episode. And imagine if, you know, half of these are new and over around 45 to 50 episodes a year. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a lot of gameplay hours. I just would not be able to do. Um, so if you're not going through and playing every single thing, the instant it comes out, how do you discover music? Is it just the word of mouth? Is it following your favorite, favorite, uh, favorite composers? How do you do, uh, sort of find bits and pieces and, you know, end up including them in the show? It is a mix of everything. Sometimes it is just following my favorite composers, following new composers. Uh, sometimes it is actually meeting people, being part of the games industry and just hearing what people have been up to and getting really excited and going, oh, that soundtrack from that composer that three people have heard in their life needs to be heard by a lot more. And uh, then it's, I think I've surrounded myself with video game news and video game conversations in a way that subconsciously helps me absorb and say, hey, everyone's talking about Pentiment. What's What's that about? And then, you know, I can go and check it out, listen to the soundtrack, understand the story, understand the art style and be, whoa, this is awesome. And this definitely needs to go on the show. And sometimes it is about, hey, what's new? What's getting released? And then it is sometimes themes that we can kind of follow that uh, basically give me an excuse to play 
particular soundtracks that I want. And our programming team is fantastic. That we have, we always collaborate on this, and we have uh, some very fun conversations around it. And this year actually marked a really interesting moment for ABC Classic as well, because you had the you know the top one hundred for the screen, which in course included a lot of video games, uh, you know, included as well as a lot of film music as well. As mm-hmm. uh, former guest of the show Dan Golding would have had, uh, you know, at, at, you know, top speed really in the <laughs> wheelhouse there. Um, can you tell me about what is this sort of influence on uh, you know filmic music and video game soundtrack music, and how is that sort of uh, working in the modern classic? listening audience how do they how do they take to it that is a very interesting question because it does come with a range of responses mostly positive because most people are very open to the idea of music in media and music in what they consume like they watch a film they play a video game they're you know binging a tv show and they can get hooked on those themes get hooked on the music that enhances their experience a few people don't take to it well because it's hey this isn't classical music and that's a whole other conversation about what classical music even is uh and the deferring definitions that people often attach to it uh and you know i'm always happy to get into that conversation but uh, that may be just another hour on its own uh but it's just I think people have been very open and very loving. And additionally, especially with this Classic 100 being music for the screen and including video games, a lot of people who are gamers and musicians and love both mediums have felt represented and have felt like seen by maybe a radio station that historically hasn't really considered that part of the audience, which is really weird because... Uh, I think there's in there can be this kind of elevation of European classical music of the past being like, this is the utmost, this is the ultimate that we should aspire uh, towards, and everything else is just a way to get there. And I'm like, that's kind of reductive because. And again, that's a whole other conversation (laughs) about it. But mostly it's been a very beautifully positive reaction. All right. Well, we've got a number of uh, pieces to listen to today. Uh, Let's start working our way through. Uh, Let's have a listen to the very first piece of music that you've selected for your top top 12 in in any particular (laughs) order. No particular order. Uh, Just some of the most uh, impactful pieces of music uh, from 2022. Now, Mina, this is one of two pieces of music you've selected from this game, one that I think people probably really would recognize. Can you tell us what were we listening to there? God of War Ragnarok from composer Bear McCreary and featuring a gaggle of awesome performers. And that's the main theme. And that theme actually kind of wraps together a lot of that narrative as well. Those characters uh, that we would experience in the world of God of War Ragnarok um, are kind of wrapped into that overarching piece. But you've also selected another one for us to have a listen to as well, which you've uh, really sort of highlighted. And and that's sort of featured in that main theme that everyone is aware of and, you know, very, very familiar with. But let's have a listen to another little piece of music. Um, And tell me why this one is really, uh, really important to you. Absolutely. So this is A Sun's Path, which for the first time features a theme specific to Atreus, who's Kratos' son in God of War Ragnarok. Now, the soundtrack does build on the 2018 God of War, which is also by Bear McCreary, and builds on that main theme, like those three notes that are like the voice of Kratos as a father repeatedly telling his son, 
and try to protect him and say, hey, you know, you got to act like this. You got to do like you got to be this way. You got to contain your anger, all those kinds of things. And because now, you know, Atreus, we've gotten to know him through the first game. He's uh, featured in the second game. He now gets his own theme. Uh, and that's also intermingled with the theme of his uh, of his mother, which is also featured in the last game. But that's what you hear in that main theme, that God of War, like Kratos, uh, Faye, and Atreus all into one. And with A Son's Path, which is Atreus' theme, you hear that on the hurdy-gurdy, which... Uh, <laughs> What's a hurdy-gurdy? A hurdy-gurdy is uh, a Renaissance early music instrument from somewhere around Europe. I'm not sure of its origin, but it's got a very distinctive sound. And if you know anything about Bear McCreary, uh, he loves to use it across all these different projects. I first heard it on Da Vinci's Demons, the TV show he scored uh, back in 2013, and he uses uses it as one of the main uh, sounds in Black Sails, if you know that soundtrack. So he just loves playing it, to the point that in God of War Ragnarok, there is a character you meet that looks a lot like Bear McCreary, that sounds a lot like Bear McCreary, <laughs> and plays an instrument that looks a lot like the hurdy-gurdy. <laughs> so he's literally become a character in the game that plays the hurdy-gurdy. And the name of the character is Rabe, which is just bare backwards. Um, I often meet a lot of composers and they have a, a particular instrument that they are completely nerding out about that they're obsessed with. Have you got something like that? For you, what is your hurdy-gurdy, Mina? Well, <laughs> I would say it's the oud, the oud, uh, because I play it. And I have played it on video game soundtracks and uh so it is probably one because i've just grown up with it uh if you don't know what that is that is the middle eastern lute the ancestor of the renaissance lute for anyone listening who's thinking oh european music is superior well we invented it first is all i'm saying <laughs> yeah no, no controversy there but uh yeah the would i'd say is uh, probably my hurdy-gurdy you've you've played that on a grammy award-winning Oh, Grammy Award, soon to be Grammy Award winning, potentially soundtrack. Is that right? <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, it's which is really <clears throat> a wonderful surprise of 2022 for my own life is uh, "Old World" by Christopher Tin. And if anyone knows that the beautiful themes from Civilization uh, four and six, those uh, gorgeous choral songs, that's Christopher Tin. And uh, <clears throat> last year we collaborated on this soundtrack, which. Uh, the game was released officially this year. I'm not even sure it's the early access thing. But uh, yeah, I was uh, consulting on the score, uh, helping Chris kind of think about Middle Eastern music, which is really part of his beautiful process of uh, approaching and engaging with culture. And uh, yeah, just played some oud and uh, sang some vocals. All right. Well, now let's have a listen to another big PlayStation tentpole title that came out uh, this year. There's quite a lot of them, really, that actually um, made it to the PlayStation 5 and the PlayStation 4. Uh, this is one that you, unfortunately, probably came at a time uh, that is unfortunate for this series, <laughs> tends to always land at this right. time. So let's have a little bit of a listen to this. So that is one of the pieces from Horizon Forbidden West. Uh, gorgeous open world game. And it does pick up from, again, similar to God of War, it picks up from Horizon Zero Dawn five years ago or six years ago when, it, when that game was released. And it builds on those themes. But what I love about this piece and many of the pieces in this uh, soundtrack in particular is the two vocalists, Julie Elvin, who you hear in the first game and on this game, and Melissa Kaplan, uh, who here narratively represents a new character. And this vocal interplay between the two vocalists kind of represents the narrative interplay between those two characters. And I won't say who they are, because if you haven't played it, it's, it's a beautiful thing to experience. Um, and the other thing is Melissa Kaplan, if you don't recognize her voice, if you've heard that iconic theme from Assassin's Creed, Ezio's family, the those four notes. <laughs> that is the voice of Melissa Kaplan. And she's been on multiple uh, Assassin's Creed's 
uh, soundtracks. We talked about Forbidden West coming at a time uh, that is, you know, unfortunate for this series because the <laughs> games are really good, um, but they have managed to land right next to some of the biggest, most genre-defining, um, you know, other entries into that series. But do you think the soundtrack is something that is going to really um, sort of stick around or elevate itself from from this game, which, which is fantastic in its own right? Absolutely. And this is actually one of the reasons I love video game soundtracks. Sometimes I play a video game because of its soundtrack, because I listen to the whole thing and I'm wondering how this score fits into the story, into the experience. And, you know, a lot of the time it's it's great. And then sometimes it's like, wow, this score is actually better than the game. <laughs> in this case, for me, in my own uh, estimation and perception horizon forbidden west score and story and gameplay just all mesh beautifully and this is an extended soundtrack that goes for seven and a half hours it's pretty much an entire work day like i want more of these like eight hour soundtracks <laughs> everywhere <laughs> There's a few intermissions in that one. If you're watching that live, I can imagine. Um, we've talked a little bit about some of the music that follows on, continues the themes of previous entries in the series. Of course, uh, Horizon and uh, God of War are both direct sequels, but there's a spiritual successor, and we kind of have to talk about the turtle pope in the room <laughs> in, a, in a way, because this game is obviously at the top of many, many, many Game of the Year's list, um, and you've also included a piece of, of music from this one. I'm sure you've already guessed it, but let's have a listen. Elden Ring. Elden Ring. Uh, yeah, many people's game of the year. And it's this for me was a little contentious because I feel like someone would have sent me some threats if I didn't include it on this list. And for good reason, because it's a fantastic soundtrack for an undoubtedly fantastic game. Now, I haven't played Elden Ring myself, so I don't have that connection to it uh, personally. The contentious part for me is the fact that this seems to carry on the sound of the Dark Souls and the Demon Souls and uh, the same slew of composers who have worked with FromSoft games. Uh, probably Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the kind of slight exception, as well as Deracine. I don't know if you've uh, heard about that game. A VR game by the same composers that has just like, the most delicate uh, soundtrack. But to me, what this represents is the consistency and excellence of this slew of composers, Tsukasa Saito, Shoi Miyazawa, Tai Tomisawa, Yuka Kitamura, and Yoshimi Kudo. Like, these are names that maybe people don't know the names themselves, but they've definitely, for the last decade or so, been playing and enjoying, and just they've been pumping uh, their, their blood to this music, really. Uh, and it's just it's just excellent, consistent output. That's that's what it is for me. So, yeah, like while it, for me, I didn't have a personal relationship with it. I'm like, you know what? It cannot not be included in a list of the top of the year. It's uh, well, these are all pretty grim, pretty grim, really. If you think about the storylines of all of these stories, <laughs> it's the end of the world, and you've got a few, uh, you know. F fleeting moments to try and see if you can turn everything around. Let's change tack a little bit, shall we, Mina? Let's talk about some things that are uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit cuter. Perhaps yes. uh, a little bit cozier, <laughs> perhaps um, a little bit more heartfelt. Uh, in some respects, one of the ones you've picked is definitely pretty dark as on its <laughs> own. Um, let's have a listen to the next piece of music that uh, you've selected. So that was from Stray, which I think was one of the breakout independent game hits. Took out both the both debut indie game and best independent game at the Game Awards just a, a little while ago. Um, 
it's a it's a story about a cat nominally uh <laughs> normally when i thought i was going to play this game um i thought i was really just going to be a cat so it's actually more surprising and you've, you've picked another piece as well mina can you tell us firstly why have you picked inside the wall which is that first piece that we listened to uh i think with inside the wall it's it represents it introduces you to the game and it also introduces you to the fact that this music isn't going to be what you expect because it's kind of electronic, but it's ambient, but it's uh, engaging because it's very easy. You see a game about a cat and because we've been trained by years of documentaries or reality TV that animals have cute, plucky sounds, but no, this is about a cat, but this world that you're going to go into isn't about uh silly cutesy humor which there's a lot of great places for that uh but stray is like no we're telling you a different story here and let's contrast this with uh, another piece that you've selected by the same composer from the same soundtrack this represents to me this is intruder and it's just a slice of the kind of electronic percussion and uh kind of more upbeat part of the score and it's about the fact that this whole thing is a sonic experiment it's 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 cute yes but it's it also fits into the sci-fi cyberpunk world that you're thrown into which the game did not need to go this hard and the score did not need to go this hard but i was like yes you play a cute cat but what if it felt like you're playing metal gear solid as a cat you know sometimes what if it felt like you're playing assassin's creed as a cat and the composer is jan van der Kuysen, and it's also for me such a great contrast from one of his previous scores uh which was also based around animals uh after, seasons after fall which was entirely an acoustic string quartet. So to me, it also represents this composer and the breadth of his experience and just what he's able to cre create. It's th This is a celebration of one of the best games of the year that I've played, uh, one of the most f enticing sounds, and the fact that so many people have been getting into this idea of chill hop and lo-fi and electronics that are sitting in the background and they don't know that they're listening to synthesizers, th these beautiful machines that look complex, but create such a gorgeous array of sounds. And that's Trey for me. That's a lovely segue into our next uh, piece of music that you selected, because I think this is going to be a lot of people's uh, chill soundtracks as they're studying. <laughs> uh, let's have a listen to, the, to an Australian composed piece. Cult of the Lamb by Narayan Johnson. You might know him as River Boy. And before he'd done video games, he was doing electronic production and R&B and uh, some kind of poppy things, especially both as a solo artist and as part of Willow Beats. You might have known him as a producer with Dreaming Now, a great, uh, great crew. But this thing about Cult of the Lamb being this uh, cute and dark uh juxtaposition the way that he kind of approaches it with these electronics and voice vocal manipulation there's even a little part in the soundtrack that has his own voice and i'm like yes i love that uh, again like stray this is one of those games that did not need to go that hard here's a cute lamb oh lamb is going through a bit of a hard time wait here's much more than you bargained for and that's what the soundtrack is because you get this kind of thematic 
uh, electronic manipulation with some plucky percussion. And then you also get some really kind of dark, uh, brooding things with uh, these kinds. Of, I don't know. I don't know if uh, formant is a term known to non non producers or people who aren't into the music production scene, but it's this thing that you can change the the way an electronic vowel sounds. It's like if you have ever heard throat singing, that's basically changing a formant in your voice. It's like. That's literally changing that. And he's like, it's doing versions of that with synthesizers and vocals and somewhere in between. And that just like blows my mind. <laughs> um, it's definitely one that has wormed its way into my mind. And I played many, many hours of Cult of the Lamb. And, you know, it wouldn't be the same game if it didn't have that amazing soundtrack uh, behind it. Um, let's talk about another Australian uh, game. Uh, this one is one that is very Australian. Uh, you know, Cult of the Lamb was made in Australia, but this is a story, this next piece is from a story that could really only be told uh, by Australians about the Australian experience. Composer and audio director Maze Wallen uh, with Wayward Strand. <laughs> I feel like I'm presenting the radio show now. I was like on the back of this track. <laughs> but uh, like you said, this is an, a story being told in 1978 Australia um, above Bunurong Land uh, because it literally takes place in an airborne hospital. But what I love about this is this is one of the coziest soundtracks and it's all really it's got the guitar at its heart and that's maze wallen kind of playing performing all throughout they perform the whole score but uh it feels very intimate it, the guitar is right there in front of you it's like you're sitting with your with your best friend and they're just playing they're plucking guitar while you have a conversation which is really just kind of what i do with my friends sometimes <laughs> if we're sitting around and i've got a guitar in my hand i'm just plucking away while we just chat about the deepest stuff and that really feels like what Wayward Strand is as an experience. What I love about this particular piece in, in particular is you can you hear a breath in at the very beginning. There's a you know you don't need that didn't need to be in there, but it's been <laughs> chosen specifically. Like your friend is sitting next to you, ready to just okay, all right, here's Wonderwall, you know that sort of thing. <laughs> it's like that moment where you kind of are preparing for a performance, and that, that's something that I just listened to and I thought, oh wow. Um, very small, tiny it's, thing. It's funny though because in my younger days, uh, it was something I might have uh, critiqued at one point, thinking I was like, "Oh, why is there a sound of a breath there?" And I remember the. Do you remember that song by Britney Spears? Um, every time, like it's that little piano. It's like every time I see you in my dreams, I see your face. Anyway, there's a part where she just kind of breathes, like on top of the chords, and. The breath is exasperation. The breath is hopelessness or whatever f emotion she's trying to convey. And me, you know, as a, like a, as a cocky 18-year-old, I'm like, why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you breathing? It's like, no, breath is so important in music production. And you capture it in this very real way. It's, it's gorgeous. All right. Well, now let's head into a darker space. Uh, some of these pieces uh, are from games that are dealing with some heavy themes, um, some things that are, I mean, it tends to actually, if you think about it, Mina, actually a lot of the games this year have kind of been about the end of the world. <laughs> I wonder why that could potentially have been, uh, why have yeah. we landed on a number of these things all at once? Uh, I, I don't know. I, what, I don't know what the last couple of years have been like. There's, there's yeah. just, it's just been fluffy rainbows. and Exactly. Unicorns. Right. Let's have a listen to the next one. That's music from Immortality, uh, that game by Sam Barlow, which uh, 
brings us back. It's actually kind of brings me back to some of the early days of gaming in the 90s that went full FMV, full motion video. And to, to know that there's still an avenue for that that is actually very viable, like it's not a gimmick, it's it's a way of experiencing the narrative. That's just, that really fascinates me. And I experienced that in Telling Lies as well, the previous game by Sam Barlow, uh, both composed by Nenita Desai, uh, and the composer, the musicians are the Budapest Art Orchestra. But one of the main reasons I love this uh, is that we don't get enough saxophones in video game scores. And the saxophone comes in front and center on the introduction to this whole experience, uh, which I don't, how do you even explain immortality to, to someone who's never played it or never seen? <laughs> well, I think you say, you know, people often argue that games and cinema are you know becoming more and more the same especially when you see these huge tentpole games like that but i mean this is a game that is a film that is a choice you know as you kind of work your way through and yeah. you know that fmv experience as well is again it was like i we, we had um uh you know we've had people on the, the show before who've talked about how in previous generations, console generations, the limitations of that console become the hallmark of that genre. And you don't Absolutely, realize it yeah. once you're in it, but it's only after the fact that you come back. And that's why we're seeing like a huge um, uptick in games that look like Dreamcast games or PlayStation 2 games now. That's why chiptune was such a huge thing, right? Because there was a limitation sure. of the of the chip to actually produce the sounds and it became this hallmark of that genre. And it's really curious to see that kind of coming back. Shall we move into a dark millennium, uh, one that is filled with brooding and skulls? So this is Warhammer 40k Darktide, and it's special to me, not because I like Warhammer. I've never played Warhammer in my life. It's special to me because of the composer, who is Jesper Kidd. Uh, you might know him as a composer of the early Hitman games and the early Assassin's Creed games. He did Borderlands. Uh, he did uh, Dark, Dark Side 2, Dark Siders 2, sorry, and Freedom Fighters. So many iconic games from my time as a gamer and he for me is the reason i got into video game music to begin with 16 years old i'm playing hitman 2 silent assassin and that hungarian hungarian choir just singing a requiem into my ears and i'm like what is this this is and it's why i love hitman it's why i love video game music it's why i now work in video game music <laughs> uh, it's a big influence. So Jesper Kid is a big influence. We also share a birthday, which is like complete coincidence. I just wasn't like, oh, this person shares my birthday. Let me listen to his music. Absolutely. Just came after the fact. Uh, but what this soundtrack represents to me is everything that Jesper Kid does coming together. Because it is for me about that... Uh, electronic side and the acoustic symphonic classical orchestral side coming together and to me he's one of the best kind of unifiers of that just in my own kind of taste like his music comes to my taste and this kind of you're hearing a pipe organ you're hearing the budapest scoring choir singing on top and there's again a narrative reason for that and the machines are actually representative like the synthesizers are representative of these old machines that people hail as mystical figures. So that, and that to me kind of brings me back to some of his earlier work. Not that he ever stopped doing this, but it's like, it kind of reminds me of freedom fighters specifically. Uh, freedom fighters was one of my favorites, still is one of my favorite scores. And this is like, Oh, this to me is the soundtrack sequel to freedom fighters. So that's, that's, but there's so much in that soundtrack. That's just great to experience. Mina, I'm curious as a 16 year old uh, composer, uh, did you submit a few Jesper kids to any assignments in, in high school? As some of my friends who loved video game music did thought I might make myself my own version of a <laughs> Jesper kid. Well, no, because I didn't actually ever do music until university. Like I didn't study it 
uh, at high school or anything. But I did study music at university, majored in composition, and my honors major research project was entirely 10,000 words dedicated to Assassin's Creed 2. So uh, I, throughout my composition degree, I was trying to, I was very clearly working towards video game music and media music in general, but uh, I had a very clear goal of, I want to write music for video games. And the minute there was an opportunity to do that in my first year, I did. And I scored a video game, uh, a student video game during my first year. <laughs> so <laughs> yes and no, but I'm also kind of trying to, I'm always trying to not be someone else. Like, yes, his influence, if you kind of know his body of work and then you listen to things of my body of work, you'd be like, hmm, I hear where you've kind of got a little bit of Assassin's Creed 2 there and a little bit of Borderlands there. And you might hear that. Most people might not. But if you just are very acutely aware of both things, <laughs> or maybe it's just me, maybe I'm just like very insecure <laughs> about my own skill. Shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Well, no one's complained so far. So let's have a listen to another piece that you've selected in our dark and brooding theme. Um, and this one's going to be paired with uh, another, well, it's also dark and brooding. I mean, they're all pretty dark yeah. and brooding, really. <laughs> Actually, you've picked quite a few dark and brooding ones. Um, but there, there's a bit of a contrast here that you wanted to uh, have a listen to and the listeners to have a listen to. So let's listen to the first one. So that is uh, composer Olivier de Riviere uh, with the London Contemporary Orchestra. And that's the theme from Dying Light 2, which came out like right at the beginning of the year. And Olivier, for me, in a similar manner to Jesper Kidd, he's one of those people who can write in classically mind and symphonic choral things great and mixes them with electronics beautifully. And to add to this is like, Olivier is a very kind of tech, technologically minded composer in the sense of he cares a lot about music systems and how the implementation works within the game and how to make it as dynamic as possible. And he talked a lot about how the parkour in Dying Light 2 would trigger different uh, ideas within the music and different stems. And uh, and this this title track is called run jump fight which is represented run is uh represented by the strings jump is represented by the brass and fight is represented by the percussion and he's just detailed all that so beautifully it's just the fact i think that it's so easy to think of people who write orchestral music as being of one mindset and people who write electronic music to be of a different mindset whereas a lot of video game composers are of both and to me i think olivier de Riviere personifies two of the best versions and how they come together. He doesn't sacrifice one for the other. And I love that. Well, this is something that couldn't really be any more different, I think. Um, yes. But I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to play it and then you're going to tell me how they're interestingly linked. is a Plague Tale Requiem. The link with uh, Dying Light 2 is that they're both from the same composer. Uh, completely different mindset, but probably the same kind of technology at work with how dynamic the music reacts. Uh, but it's just, I love choral music, and I've uh, always loved choral music. And to have this beautiful piece of choral writing throughout the entire soundtrack, uh, with the Estonian Philharmonic Chamber Choir, they're they're featured throughout. It's the fact that this takes you back to 14th century France in a very kind of visceral way. It's there's no doubt about where you are, but it's still modern as hell. And 
I love things that are... How, how so? Uh, what, what do you mean exactly by that? It's... I feel like there's an aesthetic. Like, if you watch a historical TV show that feels modern, like, it's a lot of it comes comes down to maybe the way it's, the presentation, the way it's uh, shot, the way it's lit, the way it sounds, and definitely in the score. So something like Black Sails is the golden age of piracy, but told in a very kind of modern way and in a very with a very modern score, even though it features instruments from way back then. It's this kind of modern aesthetic to an ancient art. And that really is like what video games can do beautifully as an experience, uh, take you back to a time gone to a century past uh, and really make you feel like you're there right now as you are. It's such a beautiful bridge. Speaking of those bridges, I know you really love it when um, people nerd out about the choice of instrumentation, the things that they're using to put their uh, pieces together, especially when they're using that as part of the character of a video game. Let's have a listen to this next piece. That is the sound of Pentiment. It is not, as it may sound, something that was written in the 15th to 16th century. It is something written or released in 2022 uh, by, a, by a modern medieval band called Alchemy, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> it's just like, they, I love uh, musicians that you know, that are dedicated to historical practice, but are not afraid of experimentation. And during my time at university, when I was you know, studying, we often got a lot of instrumentalists who specialized in particular instruments. And there was a lot of encouraging of experimentation. Um, so they do these like kind of super weird things and very decidedly weird just to really push an instrument and its sound and its practice as far as it can go. And to see how that comes into literally video games that people play every day. To be like, this is something that is explored in contemporary classical music practice or contemporary music practice uh, that branches out of classical tradition and canon. And just to be brought to this limelight in a very accessible way. And accessible here does not mean dumbed down. So like we're not dumbing down music to for for the plebeians to be able to it's, no it's none of that nonsense because this is elitist crap that has to go and i work at a classical station i i have heard my fair share of uh people who respond to to musical choices and like oh but you can't do this you can't do that it's like well, if we explore where your elitism comes from, that's, <laughs> again, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, <laughs> this might be the last podcast I ever do because I might get fired after this. <laughs> I, I think what you would say about Pentiment as a game is that it is just packed with attention to detail in it. In every single aspect of it. And, and I found it really interesting as well. Um, you know, whenever you're playing something or when you're experiencing a piece of media, your own context comes to whatever you're, um, you know, taking part in, right? And so for someone who grew up in quite a, you know, Catholic religious uh, upbringing uh, throughout my high school, you know, I found a lot of that stuff built into this game. And I'm curious as, you know, different people have got different understandings of their, of the understanding of faith and all of that sort of thing as you go through, you know, what they bring to it. And of course, you know, listening to the music as well, understanding the instrumentation there yeah beautiful example of like you know just taking it to the absolute highest degree of attention to detail it's one of my i think sleeper hits of the year i think absolutely mine too at least musically i still haven't played the game but like just from what i've seen and from the historical research and from like just conversations with josh sawyer uh the kind of detail that goes into it is ridiculous it's Art and history come to life in front of you, and the music is a perfect encapsulation of that. Um, and now let's talk about another example as well, which has used um, some very uh, 
time specific uh, fits within the chronology of when the game is set. Let's have a listen to our final piece uh, of music for this uh, episode, our 2022 look back at the best pieces of music from this year. So uh, if you recognize that, it's uh, Trek to Yomi, uh, which is literally like an Akira Kurosawa film uh, made into a game with some supernatural elements. But uh, what I love about this is the composers are Cad- Cody Matthew Johnson and Yoko Honda. They worked with uh, what is known as a Gaga- Gagaku Orchestra, which is a tr- very traditional Japanese ensemble. And... What they've done is the period in feudal Japan that this game uh, takes place in, which I think is the 13th century, they made sure that there was no instrument in that orchestra, in that ensemble that uh, came afterwards. It's like any instruments that were available at that time are going into this orchestra. Anything that came afterwards does not come back. So even some particular instruments that might be more familiar to people uh, you might be wondering, this doesn't sound like all the Japanese music I've heard before. It's because this is very strictly historically sourced. Um, and when you're dealing with a traditional ensemble, there's so much beautiful knowledge that goes into it. So not only are you experiencing a Kurosawa film uh, with its authentic cinematography and visual language, you're experiencing a version of what Japan might have sounded like musically in that time. And just a slice, because, you know, that's not a monolith. Uh, but I love that attention to detail as well. And just how how nerdy they got into that is just brilliant. <laughs> what role does this sort of stuff, um, you know, very particularly choosing uh, to recreate some of the music from that era, how does that fit into the sort of historical preservation of these things? Because it can be very common across the world where we lose access to to culture because it doesn't get maintained. Is this an important step, you think, uh, in continuing this sort of tradition on? I think so, because if you think about how, for example, most if most people think of samurai, what does the mind immediately go to if you're not a historian? It probably goes to Kurosawa films. You know, probably goes to these to samurai cinema, and in the same way, video games are simply another medium with which these things get uh, these stories get told and communicated, and I suppose created with like, and to be able to use the entire playground of history as to tell new stories while still kind of representing uh, what that history might have been like. Uh, I think it's incredibly valuable. And it's because I think growing up, it was easy to think the future will have zero hallmarks of the past. The future is all about like, you know, jumps, silver jumpsuits and flying cars and whatnot. It's, it's the Jetsons basically. But the more I grew up, the more I realized, no, the future is as about as much looking at the past and understanding it and recontextualizing it in a modern context as it is about advancing and going beyond it. Um, and tradition, I read this thing, uh, someone had said, and this could be completely misattributed, so I don't know uh, if this is true or not, but I liked the sentiment of it. Tradition isn't about worshipping ashes, it's about keeping the flame alive. And there is flame to be kept alive and to be enjoyed because you know, these, we keep telling some of the same stories over and over. We keep telling some of the same fairy tales over and over. We t- tell the same legends over and over. In, imagine like a whole slew of people, of uh, people from this generation who now have an insight into Greek and Greek and Norse mythology because of God of War, who have uh, some more knowledge of Renaissance Italy or ancient Greece because of Assassin's Creed. It's all these things that maybe are a push or an inspiration to look into this history 
and understand it a little more. It's a point of access. And that's why I love video games. Well, that was our look into the past of 2022. Some of the most amazing pieces of music. Uh, of course, these are just the very surface of, of, <laughs> of um, you know, what you can listen to. Um, if you want to find out more about different bits and pieces of music, uh, video game soundtracks every single week, uh, Mina, there's a pretty good place for people to go to if they want to go listen to the best soundtracks that are around. There is indeed uh, the game show on ABC Classic presented by some guy, um, this guy, apparently. And uh, every Friday at 3 p.m. AEGT, uh, but also the episodes are available online to stream on demand for like a month afterwards, uh, which is just beautiful. And they're not geolocked, so anyone around the world can listen back. And I love that. Do what I do and load up a few of them on the ABC Listen app and then just Work your way through whatever chores you've got to do. Do your dishes, do the lawn mowing or fold your laundry or whatever it is and just enjoy uh, that journey through some of these amazing stories. Mina, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for, for looking back uh, at 2022. Let's do it again next year, shall we? Absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> Sifter is produced by Fiona Bartholomeus, Daniel Ang, Adam Christou. Mitch Lowe is senior producer. And my name is Gianni Giovanni. I'm the executive producer. Thanks to Omni Studio for their support of Sifter's three podcasts. You can find a link to everything that we've talked about, all the pieces of music that we talked about on this, on our website, which is sifter.com.au, where you can read more about the games and the guests that we've featured this year. You can share the show. It's the number one free thing you can do to support us. Word of mouth is really important to independent podcasts like us. And uh, I reckon your friends will probably probably enjoy it. That's all for now. Mina, thank you so much. Thank you, Gianni. And until next time, have fun.